Let's keep it going. All the non-football people, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> or the beleaguered football people who are choosing to be here instead. <laughs> Heroes, you, me, and Amy, John. Um, welcome, everyone. I can't actually see anybody, so I assume they're in the room. Uh, maybe I should stretch this out. Oh, you do? Oh, here I go. I just was in the wrong view. Hey, everyone. Great to see you. Welcome. Going to just let some more people come in, and then we'll get started. And we are recording. Welcome everyone, great to see you. We're gonna just give a, a couple more minutes for people to come in and then we'll get started. Good to see a lot of the same, the same faces as we all became best friends yesterday. <laughs> this must be your diehard, uh, diehard folks here coming to all the things. So you guys are going to do a chalice lighting, right? So let me. Uh... We'll give it one more minute, and then we will get started. As casual chit chat while we're <laughs> waiting, this morning I just want to say I was drinking from the wonderful mug that the staff gave me of Annapolis. And I realized in this one, I'm drinking a mug of New York City. So it's my two great loves. In <laughs> wow, and here I am just drinking out of this white mug that I've had since 1998. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I almost became a set designer and so, Props are not that different. The symbols around us, I think, have meaning. Interesting. Well, what an interesting deviation. What a great way to start an interesting conversation. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. Great to see you. You're going to see us set up um, with spotlights on me and Anastasia and John, um, because what we're going to have today is a conversation we're uh, largely between your two ministers of equal standing um, to see a little bit about what that means exactly. And um, unlike in a presidential debate, I will occasionally throw a question out, but aside from that, we'll be listening along with you to, um, to the ways in which these two ministers are already negotiating their very interesting and um, a leadership model, which is new. Sometimes we are uh, able to partner like this in the UUA, but it's, it's fairly unusual for, um, for EU ministers to come in as, as co-partners. And so I commend Annapolis for being willing to try this experiment and the two ministers for, being, for, um, for jumping right in and being so transparent, being willing to be transparent about how it's working and um, being willing to be so experimental with the leadership model. So uh, why don't we just start off with our chalice lighting and then I'll jump into questions. Am I uh, doing this? I, I believe so. I shared this yesterday, but let's listen to it again. Uh, we hear all these chalice lighting, but we don't get time to absorb them. So I'm going to try this one again. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just some of what I read yesterday. Yesterday from Jürgen Moltmann, his book, The Spirit of Life, German theologian. All human communities are embedded in the ecosystems of the natural communities and live from the exchange of energy with them. 
community is not community is not merely the particular character of the redeeming spirit it is already essential to nature all creatures are aligned towards community and are created in the form of communities to form community is the life principle of created beings Amen. Thank you, John. So we're going to have a couple of hours together, more or less. Um, at the end of it, we've been collecting some questions from the congregation. We have a couple of those. Um, some of these questions I came up with originally, some that John and Anastasia have added in. We'll have a couple of questions from congregants at the end. And then at the very end, which will happen around 2.50, um, we'll have an we'll open up a link so that if you have questions remaining, you can add them in privately so that Anastasia and John can see what um, what questions still remain and, and tackle that later on. So does that sound all right? We're going to get going. All right, folks. Uh, the first question, well, some of my questions are like actually multi-part questions. So I will just throw out a bunch of questions and you can pick up whatever feels like energetic and appropriate for you, okay? The first set is, how are things going so far? How do you work? When do you see each other? And what day do you take off? <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll start with saying that things are going fantastic. Uh, the committee made a, a excellent choice. Uh, as you all may or may not know, we, we retreated and shared stories uh, back in August. And, um, and since then we, we meet, uh, once a week, uh, but we talk daily through email or direct conversations. And lastly, on the, at this point, uh, was this the one that about what, when, when do we take off? I am uh, learning to be more disciplined about that, but Mondays are generally my day off. Uh, Friday is when I write or read, and uh, I work on Saturdays, uh, not all the time, but probably twice a month. And so I try to make sure I take Monday off or leave my schedule light. I've been working quite honestly over the past uh, 12 years in a fashion where if I overwork and I'm exhausted, I'll try to do less. So I, I, I really work in a, a very non-traditional way. I have my whole life because I, I was a salesman and I worked on commission uh, from my home a lot of the years of my life. So I'm very used to being on my own and managing my time and uh, uh, since uh, prostate cancer uh, recovery, uh, I get more tired than I ever have. Uh, it, uh, tired now feels different. It used to not feel a, like exhaustion, but now uh, every day almost, I, I feel if I've been on a computer too long or read too long or been in a meeting too long, I feel exhaustion and I honor my body. Uh, so I may take a 20 minute nap and sometimes a two hour nap. Uh, because I can and I should and I want to model right living even though I know you guys don't all work the same way we work I still want to be I have to be at my best my a game for you all and I know how to take care of myself so that's my answer well I also think it's going fantastically and um yeah I really appreciate this ability to have a partner minister. And I think we'll talk more about that. But I would say, um, just to add to what Reverend John said from my perspective, my husband Kent said, um, it almost seems like Reverend John lives in our house because I hear his voice all the time from behind the door. Um, you know, we have these meetings to check in that are formal meetings, just check in one-to-one, -to -one, check in with the staff, check in with congregants about an issue. Um, and then honestly, we call each other when anything, whenever there's something that we need to talk about. And especially when there's two or three things to talk about, we just text each other and get on the phone. And so I really appreciate, I don't know if that will always be true for the next 10 years or so, but I just really appreciate at this time when I'm becoming acclimated and also starting to shift things a little bit, um, how accessible Reverend John is. So I could say, hey, I'm starting this thing that might grow into something. I want you to know early. Or this thing's going on and I just feel like we need to check, check in on it. Or hey, I want to make sure that we can just really 
know where we other, where the other one of us is as we move ahead. And so I find um, to do all that just requires that we talk all the time. Um, and so that's really great. And just as a fun thing, um, I don't know uh, where it started from, but from Reverend Fred, I got those one of those little emoji avatar people. And John and I sometimes uh, communicate via emoji avatars as well. So it's in all forms, <laughs> including uh, virtual cartoon forms. And, um, and I'd say that I, so that way I take my off day as Friday um, and I don't always, or have yet to really take Friday as an off day. Um, and partly that's because I feel like with COVID and parenthood, um, my children interrupt my day enough that I find that I need to work on Fridays. Um, but I try to have that be a day where the things I couldn't get to, I have time to versus um, intend to work. Um, and the reason why John and I intentionally took other days off is so that way one of us could claim that day, or at least I find that on Mondays, I try to be more quickly responsive to emails that are sent to us so he doesn't have to. And when I see an email come in to both of us on Friday, I go, I trust that Reverend John will take care of that when he sees it. So I feel like there's a good balance. And also similarly, even though um, Reverend John is the, the way we have shared it is the, the first point of contact for pastoral care. If something came in on a Monday, then I feel available to handle that. So again, one of the great things about having a ministerial team is a minister whose day is off doesn't have to respond to the emergencies that inevitably do happen sometimes on those days off. So I feel like we share, um, by having different days off, we're able to provide like full coverage um, and still give each other that space. I was off this morning, in fact, uh, but wanted to hear Reverend AZ, so I tuned in to hear her. And um, so off, off is an interesting term for me. Uh, some ministers are way more disciplined, I must admit. And it's something that uh, doesn't bother me right now. But if it becomes too much of a problem for myself, I will manage it. <laughs> All right. I didn't present myself as having like opinions after every time you answer. But I will say that I don't think you guys are acing taking time off. And it would be my hope that you, um, can, that you practice how you want me to continue so that you don't get too worn out. I know any person needs to have time off, right? So that would be my hope too. All right, I'll stop interjecting my own opinion. No, thank you. No, no, I, I'm with you. I just, at startups, often try to be the bossy person who like lays down some sort of UU law so that you can remind people that I'm to blame later on when you try to get your Monday or Friday. Um, all right, my next set of questions are, who is going to do what at the church? How do, how do people at church figure out who to talk to and how will you interact with staff? You wanna go first? I, I'm gonna show yeah. a full contact sheet after you're done. Perfect. I, um, one of the things that I think is just wonderful about this ministerial partnership is that um, even in places where we have overlapping strengths, the way that Reverend John and I go about that work is a little bit different. And so we divided things both to make sure that we had an equal amount of responsibility, an equal amount of ministerial responsibility, an equal amount of executive responsibility and a balance, but to also recognize that um, one of Reverend John's great strengths is his um, high level of interpersonal capacity and his ability to be relationship in relationship and present and um, have just really strong connectivity. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing and been working on as a skill for the last few years is to kind of work systematically to set up teams um, to achieve things together. So as we've divided up the responsibilities, we've lent, like uh, also considered which one of those traits best lends itself to something. So for direct pastoral care, John's interpersonal skills can come forward. And when it comes to 
setting up a care team or a, what sometimes we call pastoral associates or pastoral leaders who are lay members and the training of those, that, those are responsibilities that I'm gonna take on. So we try to divide things again, thinking about what is the nature of a certain component and what are the interpersonal parts and then what are the systematic parts. Um, another example where you can see this pretty clearly is when it comes to our staff. So John is um, the direct supervisor for all staff that isn't supervising other staff. And so he meets with them one-on-one, -on -one, he talks about their goals, he helps support some researches that like supports them, coaches them. And I run our staff teams to talk about how are we building a staff mission, a cohesive culture? How are we becoming more supportive of each other in terms of our systematic work? Um, and so those are ways that I feel like we both have a shaping force, force, yeah, um, in the life of our congregation, but recognize kind of our unique um, skills and approach. I um, want to show you all the, uh, what we call the first point of contact sheet for the ministers of equal standing. And I'm just, this is, uh, if, if any of you want this, put it in the chat. Now it's on the website, but it's embedded in a way that it'd be hard to find. We sent this out in, in August, uh, but I just want to show you just very slowly uh, how we, and, and are we there yet? No, are we, are we uh, have we gotten through organizing everything uh, that we are each responsible for and, and responsible for together? No, so we need to say that. Um, you know, it's, it's been a couple of months, but uh, we are aware of the work that we need to do. So just scrolling down, uh, you can see uh, that a lot of this job requires us to be in communication with each other on a regular basis. Uh, there's always issues around the building and things like that every day, policies, procedures, that sort of thing. Uh, some of these places where I see am the primary means doesn't mean AZ is not involved. It means sort of uh, support and vice versa. Uh, it also means that we could also lead in that area too when necessary. So it doesn't mean that that minister won't be involved. So this is the first point of contact for members to know, hey, I want to learn something about small groups. If they don't know about Josh, well, they would contact me and I would send them to Josh. Uh, as AZ says, she leads leads all of our staff meetings, our all staff meetings, uh, and our worship meeting every week, and our, uh, yeah, and our worship meeting every week. Uh, and I'm just scrolling down. You can see we both go to the board meetings and report. We share writing the report. Have we forgotten something on this list? Probably, but it's pretty comprehensive. So I'm just going to finish this scrolling and then. Uh... And I'll just say as part of this, there's a lot of different categories and it's hard to keep them straight. Um, and so sometimes what I'll just say if, it, if an issue comes, I'll just openly say to staff, have we checked your speech? Who's doing, doing it? Because I find it makes it make it help. So, um, almost done. That's it. Cool, cool. Okay. So, uh, what? what so, okay. Are you guys, are you guys getting, getting an echo? echo? Okay, maybe we can. Okay, I think it's better. What does this ministerial structure, this ministers of equal standing structure that I know is so carefully laid out before, before you were called in, Anastasia, um, what does this ministerial structure create for each of you in your view? How is it different from hierarchical ministry or solo ministry or co-ministry? 
Can I go first, John? For me, um, I find it very liberating, I think is the word. And um, I believe I find it liberating because as a soul minister, um, everything, so much fell to me ultimately. And I, it was, um, in terms of governance, like literally almost everything ultimately fell to me. And even when you um, successfully built a team and could delegate a lot, that sense still didn't go away. And now the sense of um, strength through partnership is just so evident. Um, and it's also different from, you know, hierarchical ministry, that power dynamic difference is always there. And, um, and I, in my experience, and that sense of having different amplification of voice um, and different levels of vulnerability or differing vulnerabilities affected the ability of both ministers to really, I think, proceed with confidence. Um, at least that's how I experienced it and how, sometimes how I've seen it. It's also different than co-ministry for me because um, in the co-ministries that I know, um, they weren't formed through an arranged marriage like ours was. There are people who often literally got in, had gotten married in their lives or who had said, There's, I believe we could really be a highly functional team. I, we could function as one. And they develop that and then they ap apply or go into search for one or two positions together and then they leave together. Um, where that's just not the case with Reverend John and I. So I obviously Reverend John was here before, but I think also we could have different trajectories in our future. And we're really not, we're functioning as two independent ministers in a close and collaborative and respectful and interdependent partnership, but we're two individual ministers. And for me, that really, the difference in between those two is, um, I feel liberated to act in those places where we've agreed that I'm gonna be the primary person. And I feel like I have a responsibility to check in with John and keep him up in the loop in ways that I think he needs to know um, and our partnership needs to know. But I have a great sense of independent responsibility over my work. And I have a great trust and faith that John has his own liberated interdependent sense of self-responsibility. And so I love that I could say, Reverend John is taking care of that. And I know that to be true. And I don't have to know everything that he's doing um, in the way that I might in a different relationship or to feel like um, we're so closely yoked. So for me, this has just been incredibly empowering and incredibly imbued with trust. Um, and so I love those two. And for me, um, this is literally everything I hope to experience in ministry um, and didn't know that such a thing existed because maybe until a little less than a year ago, it didn't exist, right? Um, so um, I'm just really profoundly um, grateful for having known a context like this in ministry. And you're muted, my dear. I, I would have to say that the idea existed when Reverend Fred was here about a co-equal ministry. Um, uh, the conversations between the ministers before we ever uh, really thought about sharing that information with the congregation or the board. I, I really uh, am thankful to the boards that helped to uh, push this, push this, uh, help to make this a reality by owning it themselves. 
and then uh, sharing that information with the congregation to show logically how it's done. But there is a spiritual component for me. Um, you know, as you all know, uh, going, I've been through many uh, ups and downs in the church around race and, and people rep, uh, recognizing me as the sole leader of the church. That played into play some of, some of my own internalized oppression. Uh, but more than that uh, was the spiritual awakening that I, I feel I had, which revealed to me the spiritual dynamic of this, um, that there are two energies in the universe, right? You have a positive and negative, or you have, and that's not really a, a good way to say it, you can say hard and soft energy. And it all exists in every one of us. We're not either or. Uh, and male and female is just sort of a physical dynamic of that sort of spiritual energy. And, and it is from that too that, that everything evolves and is created. So, so when, you, when you imagine that and you picture that from the two become three and then et cetera, et cetera, like a Fibonacci sequence, you realize that the one really is, is in a hierarchical structure, and I believe in hierarchies, is not really where the power and responsibility lies, right? It, it is when it comes to life in the two forces. And what's so good about this relationship is that, um, yeah, I might be yin energy when it comes to pastoral care, um, but when it comes to process, right, and, and all of the areas that we need to think about, Reverend Anastasia can be very much yang, and there's this interplay, right, um, to keep things balanced. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, at first, you know, I didn't know why. The second, it was to help support me and being a black minister in a white church. But then through the evolution of my ministry uh, and the becoming of me becoming in my own right, discovering the spiritual vitality of it, uh, while, while finding my own voice at the same time. So um, the last thing on this is that uh, my whole life is dedicated to advancing our faith as, as well as AZ into the 21st century, where I can see the demise of religion uh, coming. It's here. And I am uh, so concerned about us uh, creating a way of being that will last. And we have to remake the structures, the paternalistic structures, the patriarchal structures that we have been uh, inundated by where the energy has been imbalanced. So we're creating, this is a new, new structure for a new time that I believe is much needed in our society so that maybe corporations will adopt this and nonprofit boards and church committees and begin to look at hierarchical structure in a very different way. Because when we're imbalanced individually and collectively, we know how much we suffer as a society. Yeah. Thanks, both of you. So the next question is, you share both the ministerial and executive functions, which I know is very carefully designed by the board of trustees back in the day and approved by the congregation as well. Why is this important to each of you? So this is important. This is important to me um, because I feel um, a both and in ministry around these functions. One is um, the work that brings me joy and the things where I feel most connected to people spiritually, interpersonally, are the things that one would primarily consider ministry. Worship, pastoral care, uh, spiritual groups. Um, I'll give a pitch for my Monday, Thursday groups. I see some of my fellow journeyers are here on the call. I think those bonds are strong. Um, and I think people don't realize how much the executive functions are also a type of ministry. So it's in those places when 
things are accessible, things are transparent, things are stewarded well, all of those things build trust and safety and community. And when those things are not handled well, and I've seen them just not handled well for all the reasons they cannot be handled well, um, including ministers not having enough authority over those issues, then I find it's like we're skipping along in joy as a religious community, but we're tripping because there's these like potholes and stones along the way because the executive running of the church is so um, malformed. And so part about that is I really want, instead of a tripping and bumping and stumbling experience, I really want experience that's otherwise, which is like smooth and good and safe and clear. And so I am invested in helping UUCA be like that. And if I did that work all the time, I would no longer find joy in ministry. So that's one reason why I feel it's so wonderful not to have to do all that, but also have enough investment that I'm really caring and bringing the gifts of ministering the perspective of ministry in. Um, so that's kind of one part. And then the other part really has to do with, I think, the fact um, that I'm really cognizant that I'm a younger, I can't say young, but a younger female minister. And John is a male minister of color. And I'll let John speak to his own identity. But I don't know if you know, but only 8% of clergy in the United States are women, or women are only 8% of clergy in the United States. And so I frequently gone out, albeit in Indiana, and said, it's at a clergy gathering, and I'll be at a table with clergy, and I'll be ignored for like half of the meal. And then someone will say, so who are you here with? And I'm like, oh, I'm the minister at All Souls. And they'll say, oh, what kind of minister? And I'm like, the minister. So what do you do? And so I just find like sometimes when I was, when I, we brought a team and I was like, I'm the senior minister. Using that term, they all of a sudden didn't under assume my level of authority or leadership. And so I think sometimes keeping executive functions, unfortunately in our power warped world, um, leads people to understand the role that I would have in leading UUCA, where not holding those executive functions at all would cause me to be overlooked in ways that aren't helpful in leading our community externally. And then, John, I'll pass that to you. When, when I uh, first got here, uh, they asked me what I wanted to be called. And I said, Reverend John. Uh, some people were OK with that. Most were. A few were a little peeved that they had to call me Reverend because they called Fred Fred. And, and which shows how much we've grown, honestly, because they did not understand the context. Uh, Fred being 20 years older than me, being white, uh, more experienced, uh, uh, carries its own power source. And the archetype that I walk in from, right, from where I came from, carries with its own stereotypes and diminished power. Uh, a lot of Black people who are doctors uh, use their title uh, because it's still not common for people of color to have doctorates. It's more common but it's like the stat for female ministers. So, um, which is one of the reasons why I suggested to Anastasia, we call ourselves co-executives and it um, co-executive ministers. Uh, it's not because executive is a function. There were a few people who, who chatted with us about it. And although I still use it, not as commonly, but the reason I did was because um, and sometimes you have to be intentional about your position, about your space, uh, about your power, 
not as a way to lord it over, but as a way of um, equaling the playing field. And you have two minority ministers. And that's the only one of the, one of the things I thought would be a good way for the congregation to know right away what our, our authority was. That minister, the word minister was not enough. In fact, it was too generic. It was almost like what they asked Reverend Anastasia, like, okay, who are you with? Uh, like, whose assistant are you? And so right away, if you use the word executive, uh, people know that's, it brings with it its own space uh, to be at the table. I don't feel personally like I need to. I never have. Uh, but it's necessary. And um, that's really been the main reason behind my early, my first title, Rev, and then now this title that I've, I've been using somewhat co-executive. And I'm going to add just one thing to that, too is something that I think is maybe not obvious and valuable to say, which is I actually think us openly and sort of publicly claiming our responsibility over executive function may actually be a very pastoral thing for the members of UUCA. I know that there's been a lot of Um, some pain, some neglect, some bumping into, some struggles around having a smooth operational experience at UUCA. And I actually think one way that you all will come to trust us more, more as ministers is when you see that is happening more smoothly and you know that we're caring about you guys through our operations, not just because we think you're really cool, which I think many of you are really cool, but we're also caring about you in that systematic sense um, and making sure you have the information you need and things like that. So I look at it as, as actually by claiming this and wanting to do it well, that might help some healing happen. Um, and so, if that seems like a new idea, I, I invite you to like try it on and think about that for a little bit and then let us know if you think that's happening. Um, I'd be really interested because certainly what I want is for UUCA to be a place where you feel ever more um, like it's a space of trust where you're really held and um, can participate in in ways that um, feel safer and, and um, more open. What is the relationship between you as, as ministers of equal standing and the board of trustees? Well, I, that relationship uh, is established, of course, through our uh, you know, bylaws and, and we are sort of just working some of those things out. We're not we're not there yet. That would this would be a great question for uh, Heather to also participate in. We uh, we go to you know go to the meetings and we pro provide a board report and update on all the different ministries within the, the congregation. Um, we we have our voice is available. But we have executive limitations that hold us uh, sort of accountable to our job. So beyond like what our everyday goals are or yearly goals are, we have these limitations uh, and in a way they're expectations uh, that we will do uh, right uh, by our, our members, that we'll be people of integrity, uh, that we will lead with vision, uh, but also that we won't uh, abuse that authority and I take all of that very seriously, especially right now in our country. Uh, strong leadership and trust is a, is a dying thing. Uh, so that relationship is close, it is intimate. Um, and I trust the board in how they communicate with the congregation. I've trusted them for a long time. Why? Because they've shown 
me uh, that that trust has been reciprocated uh, in how they've uh, supported the ministers and the ministry in providing uh, as much uh, conversation uh, with the congregation uh, and the concerns that are historic around communication, which some are true and some are not, some are myth. Um, so that's my response. See, this is wonderful. I'm learning things through this session already, which is really great. Um, I, I put this question in because I don't really know the answer. So John, it was so great to hear your answer because um, that, that's helpful for me to know how you experience it. And I like to think about there's like relationship on paper and then there's the experience of it. And, and I just don't know yet. Um, and I'm interested in building that more. Sometimes I think about, um, I say, take this congregation or take this thing and tell it to me in some adjectives, like three adjectives. And I, I don't know what those adjectives are yet. <laughs> like there's nothing wrong and I have a lot of uh, trust and faith, but I don't know, um, you know, where we're really heading towards like, oh, is it perfunctory? Is it trust-filled? Is it antagonistic? Is it generative? Is it collaborative? Is it, um, you know, like I think it, board relationships with ministers can be all sorts of different things and they could also change between ministers and boards as there's turnover. Um, I, I want that to be as those, that relationship to be what is, provides the most health and vitality for the congregation as, at large. And in my experience, um, Unitarian Universalists need a lot of work and understanding how to, for both the ministers and the board to do their work and do it in ways that produce that vitality and that help the other function well. Um, and so that's some of the things that I'm really excited to discover with the board and um, perhaps good news for the many of you, but the board has another section session with Reverend John, Megan and I on this, this coming Thursday to talk about that. Um, so I'll just say, I don't know the answers yet, but I think we could um, discover them and start to discover them more fully on Thursday. I hear from Amy Kent behind the scenes that actually Heather wanted to jump in and say a couple of words and apparently can be spotlighted. So hold on a second, we're gonna, we're gonna rearrange our scores for just a minute and hear from her. She miraculously appeared, <laughs> the magic of Zoom. Go ahead, Heather. Hi, since John referenced me, I thought maybe I should respond a little bit and I kind of want to uh, support what both John and Anastasia said, which it, or at least what I heard, which is this is kind of ongoing. It's not yet totally determined. Um, and so I am finding as both a member uh, of the congregation and a, as a member of the board, I am finding this discussion really helpful uh, in clarifying how are we going to do this? And I want to give a shout out to Congregational Conversations because that's where the term uh, Ministers of Equal Standing first arose. Um, the wisdom of the board to pick it up and pass it on to, um, to uh, the, the minister, the, the search committee. Um, I want to give credit to the board for that. But this term actually came up from the congregation mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what it means for the board and for our ministers of equal standing and for UUCA and for UUA is a challenge, uh, but also it's kind of exciting times. Um, and so much right now is not exciting, 
So I'm super excited about this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. That's great. <laughs> All right, I assume I'll be back. Here I come. Um, next question is, what sort of feedback feedback loops are available to congregants if they don't think things are going well or if they think things are great? We always love positive comments, right? Um, or if they have ideas, what are the feedback loops um, that you're developing for that? I am. Um, we're open. We're here. Um, our email is available. I, I encourage people always to reach out, send a note of thanksgiving or joy, sorrow, concern, need. Uh, some members uh, call me, call me on my cell, and and we talk. So. Um, I want us to have an open relationship and I don't want people to sit in corners and uh, be frustrated or feel like they're not being heard. This is uh, so open, uh, accountable relationship. So that's my response to that. I, um, I also don't entirely know the answer to this. I think John is right. And I want to, sh that we're, we're open. Um, and I'll just share that um, what I observe about myself in ministry is that I sort of collect things and notice trends. Um, and so, and because I try to do, I'm about to talk, bring on my systematic thinking, as I just said, John's like interpersonal, I'm here, I'm with you. And I'm like, here's my little systematic hat. Um, so I pay attention to that. And so I think if you come to me and you're like, here's this issue and I'm like, okay, thank you. I'm gonna think about that. Um, I think some people might think, you know, she thought about that and it's been a week and I haven't heard anything like, wow, she just blew me off. But actually what I'm doing is <laughs> I'm thinking about it I'm paying attention to the landscape. I'm seeing if there's something that could happen about it. And I'll say the, I really try to be responsive and I find that I could take things in actually quite bold directions, but they're often not quick. So if there are questions about things, I'm gonna be talking to the people who work on that. I'm gonna be thinking about with staff. I'm gonna be talking about the culture. and so. Those things will happen, um, but they happen um, in a passage of time. And I may or may not come back and say, oh, do you remember this? Um, because it will seem a while ago and it might have seemed like an offhand comment, but, but I really do incorporate that. I also, I recognize um, that it could be helpful for there to be a place to take a different range of concerns or feedback. Um, and so one of the things that actually Reverend Christina Leon Tracy developed in the congregation she serves now is kind of a policy around that, which I found really helpful. And so I don't know if we have something like this, so I'm a little uh, sheepish to say, I don't know, but it had three tiers, which I thought was really helpful. And one, the first tier was you have an opinion about something. You like a piece of music, you don't. You want this kind of program or you don't. It's really an opinion about something you want. And that, and those kind of get just filed away, sort of as I was saying to say, oh, we hear a lot of people who are really interested in a bell choir, right? Okay. Or we had one person who's interested in a bell choir once. Okay. Um, the second second thing was there's something, there's a policy in place or there's a practice in place and that wasn't followed. Um, and so that kind of, there needs to be a question of um, maybe performance isn't quite the right word. Sometimes that is the right word, but to say um, something went wrong. We have a good system, but something went wrong and we actually need to talk about that. And then the third level was our system is wrong. So I actually heard, um, for example, our Building the Beloved Committee community 
um, team said, we want to change some of the systems in terms of the bylaws review, right? So there's actually a different process for responding and recognizing those three, but I thought that it was really helpful to say opinions aren't the same as performance questions aren't the same as kind of justice related changes. Um, and so I thought it was really helpful to have a system that actually uh, recognized the distinguishing factors between those both and talked about how those can be talked about and to whom. So that might be something that we could talk about putting in place if, if UUCA doesn't have something like that because we want to make sure that your voice and input is heard in this community that you're such a shaping part of. What do you see as core goals for the next year or so? This very interesting year that we're in. I wrote down a few things um, that I'd like to see happen and they're, they're more uh, broad. And one is to keep our faith grounded in love. Uh, The next is growing our membership. The next is finding ways to keep members engaged and growing spiritually. And finding ways to connect our families and our children more effectively. And uh, I would add, uh, finding a way to uh, to allow generosity to flow more in our congregation uh, through good works, stewardship, and the like. I'm so glad that John has these goals. I feel so new and like I'm trying to get my feet under me. Um, I'd say um, this year, in addition to just getting started well. So thank you so much for showing up today and figuring out where things are. I, I spent like an hour looking for the first aid kit the other day. Um, so I definitely have some basic things to just figure out. Um, you know, this pandemic is really hard. And then there's all the stuff in our society, right? Um, but the pandemic puts us at risk in ways it adds risks to every single one of our lives. And so one of my goals is um, for us to work as a community and as beloveds to one another to keep each other safe. So my goal is every one of you, um, despite, despite COVID being all around us, every one of us is able um, to come and be with us when we open our doors and are really able to worship on Sunday together. So that's my goal. I want you to be around. I want me to be around. I want all of us to be around. Um, and then to have, to spiritually and interpersonally have what you need this year as we kind of hunker down to get through this. Um, you need some, some nourishment in that time and support. But I also I, am thinking a lot about what I want that experience to be when we are back open again. Um, how do we have middle hour come back and be glorious? How do we have, um, how have we already thought through the in-person worship experience while also keeping a virtual worship experience that people who want to continue that way still can? How can we be prepared to fully welcome our children and youth back when I will tell you every single congregation I know, that group has been extremely hard hit in terms of congregational participation um, during these COVID times. So how are we ready to return? That is like, everything I'm driving for is what are we doing now? How are we ready to return? And how are we letting you know, besides this moment, that there is goodness when you come back? Um, I think that promise of the goodness of our community is really important. Um, and then I'll just say to zoom out more than a year, uh, Reverend John and I think 
uh, if the model and the work that we're doing around equity, inclusion, diversity, non hierarchical leadership, adaptive leadership, emergent leadership, um, all that work might not only be like a, an incredibly vital thing for all of us, but it also might be a real model to offer to the world and to UUism. So I'd say like, I'm both like very humble, like how do we think through middle hour? And then also being like, we're unleashing this tremendous transformative force in the world. So, um, so we're bold as well as practical, I'd say. My goal never, my, my goal has never changed since I've been a UU. Uh, to find people who are yearning for our message and intentionally to get this message to more people of color. Uh, I think that will uh, help just becoming more diverse, not just in our, in our music and in our religious thought, but uh, racially diverse. I wanna name that too. Uh, that is something that uh, has not happened yet, but I suspect and believe that it will. Uh, uh, and I tend to say when we're ready, it will. Uh, and I think we're more ready than we've been. So I, I continue to have faith in, in, in the future and the present. Great. For over three decades with Reverend Fred, there was a white male senior minister. You are the first called female minister and the first called minister of color for UUCA. Reverend John, you've been here for 11 years while Reverend Anastasia, you have arrived in August. Given this context, what do you hope congregants are considering as you, as you each and the congregation settle into being and having ministers of equal standing? What do you hope congregants are considering? But this takes time. Uh, that all that we've done takes time. Uh, that the work is uh, the work is not my responsibility or a Reverend AZ's responsibility, but it's all of our responsibility. They they consider being more uh, jumping in more and realizing from what I talked about that what we do here ripples and creates itself in the larger community. That we are remaking the world right here and that's worth an investment. Um, that's a worth an investment in this ministry model in having uh, two strong leaders. It's worth investing in our time, talent and treasure. Uh, so that's, that's what, what my response would be to that question right now. I, um, one of the things that I um, find both interesting and curious and sometimes just wish were otherwise was how much assumptions, un implicit assumptions um, enter the room and sometimes trip us up. So I'll just say, I, I think in all honesty, you have two ministers to get to know um, and to get to know pretty fully. Um, and I say this in part because I'm new, but also I was your intern and, um, and, and also when I was an intern, there was just a lot of, I get a lot of comments about my age and gender and um, in ways that weren't supportive of ministerial authority, I'll say that. Um, and so, and so I, I don't want there to be an assumption that I'm um, interested or, or taking on something based on my identity or that I'm uninterested or uncapable based on my identity. And I'd say in my experience, um, and you guys know this all so much better than I do, but there's just been a lot of assumptions about John um, over the years. And I would say, 
Reverend John um, was also really clear about the role that he held when he was the associate minister and what it means to be an associate minister to a senior minister. And so that also meant that there were lots of parts of him that you hadn't gotten to see. Um, a lot of gifts that it wasn't always appropriate to let shine or to demonstrate that now he has gotten to. And so I hear actually a lot of you, when you talk to me, you're like, Reverend John's doing all these things like that are really great. Um, and so that makes sense because he's fully living into a different role. Um, but I think when you see someone in one role for 11 years, you begin to think that's who they are. And I, I actually just think there's a whole lot more to Reverend John and a whole lot more to me than you might know. Um, and so I invite you just as a curiosity, if you have a default of like, oh, I'm gonna call one of us to just think for a moment of, oh, is there, is there an, like, why, why this one? Is it because it says on the sheet that I should call them? Or is there something else? And, and I think it's fine to feel like a personal connection to one minister more than the other. That's actually what I think is great. Like not, I'm not gonna be every congregant's bee's knees. There are gonna be some people who just find me like a little frustrating and how wonderful that you'll find John like utterly charming and life-giving and funny and joyous. So I really feel comfortable about that. Um, and I think that's fine, but just, just a little bit of a pause sometimes as you're perhaps making assumptions about what we're interested in or capable about or who's gonna be a better listener or anything like that um, to just hold a little curiosity and perhaps um, perhaps just wonder about that. And, and if you need to talk to someone, um, I don't know, talk to one of us or talk to a friend or talk to someone, I guess. Um, but I, I just urge that because I, I hope that you give both of us um, a tremendous opportunity to shine and some opportunity to um, figure things out and to learn from mistakes and all that sort of thing without making larger assumptions or judgments from there. Yeah, we've, we've learned a lot with each other. Um, you know, just how wise you are and your way with words. Uh, sometimes I can't always articulate to white people in a way that you can. <laughs> I wish I could, but sometimes because of culture and difference, I don't quite have the right way to say it, which is another reason why this ministry works so well. And it's not to say that I can't articulate it and people won't hear it, um, but um, your background and experience make you uh, just so uniquely qualified to articulate a lot of the things that uh, sometimes I have trouble getting across, just like what you said just now, um, without sounding uh, egotistical or defensive uh, or trying to, you know, build myself up in any way. Um, thank you for that. Well, I'm learning how to be as good as you are, so. <laughs> I am, you know, I am pretty zen. I am. And um, you really and, are. Like, and resilient and fun. I feel, I feel like I found a way for myself. And so, what I offer to the congregation is what I've, you know, as a, as a Black man who's grown up and seen people killed and seen a lot of trauma and, you know, and yet I'm at peace with my life. Um, I think that's worth sharing and I think it's worth hearing. Um, and I think I have a unique position to be here right now in right now what is a mostly white congregation. Um, and and I, I believe I'm here for a reason, I, I do. I just, all the paths I could have taken, here I am, here you are. And um, so I take every interaction, I think, and I think of things just so everyone know, I think of things as they, I play everything out. I play everything out in my head to see what is the end result. And if it doesn't end in love and reconciliation, I know it's not the final thing uh, because that's where I am. I have ended in love and reconciliation. 
and and I'm and I'm happy with myself. I love myself, and I, I'm, I'm not worried about my life or my death or the world. Uh, I just want other people to to live in that joy and that place of wholeness, and uh, in the most humble way I can say that. So we're so lucky, you know, to have you, John. But it's also it's so good because, um, you know, it's so funny. I feel like right now I feel like such a New Yorker, which is you know great, but also. Um, you know, I feel like one description I heard when I, at the end of seminary, seminary, I moved up to Massachusetts and I served a congregation up there and um, as the youth director and this guy walked up to me, it was like, I had been across the room from him in an hour and he walked up to me and he said, you're a New Yorker. I could tell I'm one too. And I said, how can you tell? And he goes, a little crusty on the outside, all warm and gooey on the inside. <laughs> And I think it's true. And I think I am warm and gooey, but like you just have this eminent love and um, the way that you support people and bring joy into a room and positivity is just a really good counterbalance to my, a little bit, I realize I'm a little bit of a tough girl, New Yorker sometimes in contrast, which is not always how I think of myself, but it's, it's great to have that, um, that softness, that love, that positivity. And so I think that these are the things that are really important. It's just really important to have your energy with us Thank you. and your life experiences and your home decor. She <laughs> only gets credit for that. I'm very impressed with the whole chest speak you got going on there. So we have one more question from our questions and then we have a couple of congregant ones. Um, the last question that we created together was that Reverend Fred left quite a legacy in this congregation. How will this new chapter honor what has gone before? How does this shape what you hope for UUCA after the pandemic is over or while it's going on? My, this is an invitation. Um, November 8th, Reverend Fred Muir is coming back to preach uh, on our theme, decolonize, Decolonizing Our Faith. And I, uh, Reverend Anastasia and I have spoken with him and talked with him and we sort of reached our own covenant or agreement and we're excited to bring Fred back to, in a, to our fold. You've noticed he's been coming to worship services. He, um, he misses you and, and we miss him. Um, that is one way that we're gonna hold on to the, and remember the past. Um, those memories and institution memory, which Reverend Anastasi wants members to really hold and own, is something he will bring back into our fold. Um, and so you can expect to hear from him from time to time, uh, but not in a way that uh, would undermine, but would support, because he shares the same vision of creating beloved community within the church and with, uh, and then with, within the larger community. So I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, next chapter to have your two called ministers and your minister emeritus uh, working together. I'll add to that. Um, I'm gonna quote a few people, one of whom's in the room. So Heather, you could tell me later if I don't get this right. And um, you know. But when we were planning for this, um, I'll just say that one reason, one reason I came to you guys as an intern and that one of the reasons why you rose um, to the top of my list and entered my heart in the call process was because I hear that you guys have a vision and a mission and a passion and a commitment and a resiliency towards building the beloved community. I want that. It's, it's been a call for me to be part of that kind of community that predates my call to ministry by like a good 15 years or something. Um, it's really deep and um, 
some people would say, oh, Fred had a vision around beloved community. And he certainly did have a vision for UUCA to build that. And that vision is not uniquely Fred's, of course. Um, but I'd say when I think about his legacy, I think about continuing to live into that vision. And when we were planning this um, session um, and Heather was on the call, she said, it's so interesting, you know, that Fred had that vision and um, Heather feels like we're living into that more now than when Fred was here. And, you know, Fred also um, feels that way and looked at it as part of his work. There's a um, congregation in New York City called Middle Collegiate. Some of you will recognize the name of their senior pastor, Jackie Lewis. Um, and that is a diverse congregation in terms of ethnic makeup, racial makeup, economics, everything like that. And um, the Jackie Lewis, who is a black female minister, her predecessor was a white man who said, I got the congregation as far as I could and I got them to a place where I could get them no further, but I got them a place where Jackie Lewis could come in and lead and get them further. And Fred, Fred was, has been preparing for that for a really long time. And so um, I'll just say, I feel very much in line with Fred's legacy, not because it's Fred's legacy, though I love him and appreciate him, but because this is a, a vision that I want so much. Um, for us. And so I feel like there's actually very little broken in, brokenness in terms of legacy. It's actually a picking up of a mantle or a passing of a torch or a blessing of one generation to the next or all those things. All right, we, um, we got just two congregant questions when we put the word out last week. Um, and again, if you guys are forming questions that still remain for you, we will have an opportunity for you to share those with the ministers at the end. Um, but I have two questions. One is about finances, which I think I've, I've found that most congregations are asking questions, especially in this pandemic. Uh, the question is, can we afford to full-time ministers. I'm wondering if you could reflect on that and, and maybe just extrapolate a little bit on finances in general. Can I take the lead on this, John? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd say that is something for us to discover. And I want to lift up something around, are two ministers something that we could afford, um, that we could spend? because it, it says to me something, which is that the financial resources of the congregation are fixed in a way that, that other things like perhaps land is fixed or something like that. There's a certain quantity of it. And I think that the more accurate understanding is there's a range there's a range in which UUCA financially could exist. We're not, to, you know, tomorrow going to all of a sudden have $27 million, right? That, like our budget won't grow into that. Um, I still got excited, John, though. Um, but, but also we're not going to have like $300,000 next year, right? There's a little bit of a range. And that range, you know what it reflects the most? It reflects um, two things or three things in, in that interplay with one another. One is um, and the most critical is uh, your relationship with this congregation. How you know that this congregation informs your life, lives out your values, um, shapes who you are, helps you grow into the person that you want to be, helps you become more kind, loving, justice-seeking, spirit-growing, generous. 
it also is a question just about the amount of resources, access to funds that we as a community have, um, both in terms of income and wealth. And the third part is our worthiness, how well we're living into um, being a congregation that is worthy in loving, worthy in living our values, worthy in becoming the beloved community. And that last part is something you also deeply inform. So I'd say, um, can you afford two ministers? I think the answer is yes. If we're working together to make a worthy congregation, and if there's an opportunity to really reflect on how impactful it is to be part of that. Um, and so I'll just say, I. I think it's an open question, but I think there is um, amongst the available answers, a very strong yes. My response would be, how can you not afford two ministers? Boom, um, mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, um, ministry is, is an investment and the value of community and, and how important community is. Um, it's a reflection of what we, what we value. I mean, it's sort of, sort of, as I've been saying recently, our town, uh, our ability to model to the world and to ourselves what living a life is, is all about. Living a life uh, in a space where people are free to learn and grow and express themselves. Um, the willingness to to invest in that has to do with, of course, the idea of scarcity and generosity, which I would love AZ to add some of her language here. Um, for me, uh, scarcity says that it's not possible, um, or it's the individual is saying it's not possible that I can do this. Um, and so some of that, I, I really wish people would talk, spend that conversation with themselves because maybe it's a personal conversation, not a public conversation. Maybe it's what you are not willing to do. Because as I see it, and uh, I, I look at the TV and all the money flying for candidates who, uh, only rec uh, represent a little of our values, some of our values. Um, uh, people all across the world investing millions of dollars in, into candidates who represent some of our values and candidates who don't represent anything that we stand for. And it doesn't seem to be a shortage of, of resources. Uh, the only shortage is what we're willing to, what we're willing to do. And um, we made the commitment to this uh, uh, arrangement in terms of leadership. And I would love to see the congregation invest in it further. Last thing is that you know, a man who um, didn't come to church much, Mr. Bernathy, I spoke to Daryl every Sunday when he was here. He was a quiet man. I, I had no idea he was planning to leave resources to our congregation in, in effect $100,000. And he died and we got this note and we were all stunned because there was no relationship developed, but he got what and who we are. He got it. And, and it's just, it just gave me chills to think that he invested that much in us. And as a result, of course, you see the windows and shades and carpet, that's a Bernathy, uh, willing to invest in the congregation. Uh, so the resources are there if we think abundantly. And our last question for today is, how will we know what's happening from now on? So what's, what's a, how, can, how can transparency happen in this time where there's so many restrictions on how we're getting our information and being together. Any thoughts on that? How much time do we have left? 
I don't really have a comment to that. I actually am curious personally to hear what other members may have to say. Are we opening the floor or no? No? We aren't today, John, but people can, um, I think it. I think it's perfectly fine to mark a conversation for, you know, what's to come, so. So, you know, I, I hope what you guys see a little bit today is, and I'll say this has been really quite authentic other than having Megan here actually facilitating, but I think it's really important to see just how much joy John and I have in working together. Um, and you guys would see that a lot more um, if we were all together on Sundays, right? Um, so all this to say is come 10 months, things are gonna, you're gonna be able to have more observation points. And um, I'm aware of two things. One is um, the congregation I served in Indianapolis um, had a lot of dysfunction. And one of the things that I just naturally did as part of that was I functioned like really transparently. Um, so much so that in the search process, <laughs> committees would say to me, they're like, you're just like really open about stuff. <laughs> like you're just very, very open. Um, unusually so. And I was like, oh, really? I just, it didn't occur to me to um, put a gloss on things, um, around things, because I, I'm not scared of having the real and open conversations. I actually think we have an incredible capacity to have conversations about things in which we feel vulnerable. Um, so I really think things function better when we are um, able to communicate and put that out there and it just lowers people's anxiety. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is improve our communication vehicles. So that way there's, um, in the know has kind of become, a, which is our weekly e-newsletter, it's become a vehicle that is like part car, part airplane, part like cargo train. It's like a whole bunch of things because it's become the everything. Um, and so we're actually really trying to figure out how to have communication vehicles that are well suited for the message that they're carrying. Um, and so hopefully that will work. Um, but also I'll say, and one of the things as part of that is when you have those vehicles, um, communication vehicles, then as a staff and as congregants, we could say, what messages do need to be out there because there's also clarity about where to put them and that people are expecting them. So I'm all about transparency and clarity and people know what's going on. And um, I have yet to see an organization that communicates enough. So there is like always more communicating to do. Um, so I find, you know, Reverend John and I have all these scheduled meetings and we still need to call each other because there's always more communicating to do. So I don't want to over promise and be like, we are going to communicate because one of the things that we'll always need to challenge ourselves to do is to communicate more. So if you, my dears, could kindly, kindly tell us, hey, um, it just seems like we don't know where things are at. Um, a prompt like that, um, I know Reverend John and I will try really hard to be responsive to. Um, and then I'll just say, if, if the question was meant in a deeper way, beyond like the what's going on to uh, like, how are things really going? Um, what I could tell you is um, Reverend John and I, I think hold the deepest care for this congregation. 
um, and a deep care for one another. And when things get tough, I think we're gonna bring that deep care. And we're also as mature people and as ministers going to try to make decisions that, um, that come out of that deep care. So um, I want you, I hope, I hope that what we do and how we do our work will build trust that that is true um, as we move forward. Reverends, what a lovely time it's been to listen to you reflect on your new ministry together. And I'm so excited for the future of, um, of Annapolis as a congregation and to see you live into this ministry together and to see what happens with your church and community, both inside this pandemic and as we emerge, which of course we will someday. Um, so thank you for your open and vulnerable sharing. And thank you for embarking on this project on behalf of this community of faith. I think it really matters. Um, so I think we're wrapping up our time. Um, I am, if you still have questions and want to know more there, uh, Amy has put in the, oh, she's put it there twice even for you, link to the, to a place where you can ask questions anonymously. So it will end up being in a private form so that the ministers will know that that's still a question that's open in the community. Um, so I, we're going to leave that open for another half hour or so, so that you can add in some questions if you have any, and that will be information for the ministers to use in the future. Megan, I want to say thank you to you and Amy, who you don't see who's behind the scenes. Uh, thank you for years ago when you came to us and facilitated a very difficult conversation. Uh, knowing that you are facilitating conversations always makes it a lot easier. Uh, because uh, not that this was difficult, but I, I, I trust your leadership and uh, you've been walking with us on this path and, and here you are in your regional lead position. So thank you and uh, thank you, Amy. Well, you're very welcome. And thanks to Annapolis for your commitment to the UUA, which of course we're all bound together in a covenant anyway, and I'm happy to help. It is what I am uh, paid to do, but I'm paid in part by you guys. And I really appreciate the commitment that you've made to us and to all of us together. It enables me to come and help you and it enables me to help come and help all the other congregations too. So uh, Amy and I, Amy behind the scenes with the magic and uh, I are always happy to, to be with you. And of course, I'll be with some of you again on Thursday with the board and then believe it or not, even a fourth time um, with, with the reverends and the staff later on as we, as we get started up. So um, it's, a, it's been a delight to be able to spend this much time with y'all the benefits of a long-term relationship, right? All right, folks. Well, I hope the rest of your days go very well and that you get some rest and maybe even watch some football um, if that's your thing. It is mine, so I will be going out to do that right now. Have a wonderful time. We'll see you later. Bye, guys. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> go Ravens. See you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Megan, feel free to go. I'm going to just um, stay until some people sign off in case they still need that mentee link. Okay, sounds good. Um, thanks, Amy. I think that went well. And I, I think will it went very well. I, yeah. do, I, am, I have the recording and I will uh, get that with the other recording to them. And I will see you, well, I'll probably see you before Thursday, but I'll definitely see you Thursday. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Amy. All right, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.